Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> sure, microphone. I used to play blues harmonica on one of these things. <laughs> Never got to be Charlie Musselwhite, though. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, Wayne mentioned that I'm at the University of Auckland. Actually, that's recently changed. Um, I'm now back at UCLA, and I'm starting back uh, this August. So I'm, a, uh, I'm actually an um, honorary professor at the University of Auckland right now, but back at UCLA. We're sickeningly aware that the phrase, the development of underdevelopment, still retains as much analytical and heuristic value today as it did when it became popular slogan above 40 years ago. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the transformations within global capitalism, and then I want to talk a little bit about the role of, of uh, Marxist humanism in addressing those transformations in uh, transnational capitalism. This phrase underscores the nature of the process whereby economic development in the so-called first world, characterized by social inclusion, is internally related to simultaneous underdevelopment or what we might call overexploitation in the so-called third world, accompanied by massive social exclusion. This is, as Frederick Jameson notes, a situation that demands to be understood dialectically. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the real importance of dialectical reasoning as a form of pedagogical praxis. Jameson writes, this is not simply an unfortunate combination of circumstances, but rather a genuine dialectic in which the positive and the negative are dependent on each other and evolve simultaneously and by interaction. The dialectical system underscored here can be described in more general terms as the structural necessity for capitalism to create a reserve army of the unemployed and to exclude whole sections of society, or here, in globalization, whole sections of the world population. As a dialectician of the political unconscious, Jameson turns to the opposition between work and unemployment that characterizes the history of capitalism and reveals that the positive term, work, has not one, but two opposites. And I think this is important, very important. The reserve army of the unemployed, and those aged, infirm, as well as the famous lumpens, who are not available even for the seasonal or boom condition employment for which the reserve army is destined to be drawn upon. But what term will now oppose the term the unemployable, the missing fourth term in Jameson's system, which will allow us to fill in the blank that appears opposite the term unemployable, and which is implicitly identified in Marx's capital, is what Jameson calls the formerly employed. What we're seeing is part and parcel of today's epidemic of transnational capitalism are the working populations, once active in vital industries, which have now ceased to function, and around which idle factories, the veterans of dead labor live on with their families. Mapping this situation globally, we're seeing first and second world, so-called first and second world workers hesitate between the status of a reserve army, should new industries and possibilities start up in their immediate vicinities, for instance, in that of the formerly and now permanently unemployed situation of people whom development has permanently passed over. Now, this situation, of course, has been accelerated by neoliberal capitalism's tireless quest for ever cheaper labor, abandoning the former workers of the Mexican maquiladores who assumed the tasks of former U.S. factory workers and moving to a China where already recently built factories are being closed in view of even lower paid labor elsewhere in Southeast Asia. So as educators, we're interested in how global capitalism is dialectically interwoven with underdevelopment, in how this pro or with overexploitation, in how this process is related to the production of knowledge, specifically in school systems and how such school systems teach us how to think, 
to research and to develop our methodological skills that often leave us degage and docile. And as we understand it, prior to the ascendancy of neoliberal capitalism, the primary mission of mass schooling was to create the deep character of the nation state by legitimizing the superiority of elite culture, transcoding the culture of the ruling class with the culture of the nation state, so that both were essentially seen as natural, symmetrical reflections of each other. Schools were important mechanisms in the invention of the identity of the modern nation state in the era of industrialization, and played an important role in developing the concept of the citizen, a concept always contested by many groups, including conservatives, liberals, and radicals. And I can remember first coming to, to, the, to the United States, 1985, working with Henry Giroux, uh, and, and really engaging in these kind of debates about democratic citizenship. I mean, it was really like, they were important debates. You know, what was supposed to be in the canon? So we'll put in Rigoberto Menchu, right, uh, for instance. Um, and these were really important debates. And there were different opinions among, you know, liberals, radicals, uh, conservatives, left liberals. And, um, and those debates were really invigorating and I think important. But about, I think, 1985, and I'm just going to skip over some of this, but 1985, when the when uh, corporations, I'll just put it very simply, when corporations began to have more power than nation states, when corporations began to acquire more power and more um, prominence than nation states, that began began to change. The notion of the democratic citizenry was replaced with the notion of the consumer citizen. So all those debates just are meaningless now. They're absolutely meaningless now. We can still have them. They're artificial. I think they're superficial. Um, and we can, we can you know, go in our academic journals and engage in those if we want to. But I think they're relatively meaningless. Richard Quantz, a friend of mine, a wonderful scholar at Miami University, has examined critical reflection, or the lack thereof, of U.S. high school students and identified interaction patterns between teachers and students in learning situations in high school classrooms uh, that were modeled after uh, uh, puzzle solving, actually. And this is going to relate to the point I just made. He distinguishes three types of knowledge produced in these problem-solving scenarios, and these are high schools in, around the Cincinnati area. So he went in, did some ethnographic research, um, and saw classroom interaction in the terms of, well, okay, Loosely speaking, we could say that it's problem solving. And you notice these interaction patterns. Um, conventional knowledge or action, technical knowledge or action, and meaningful knowledge or action. So he associates conventional problem solving with modern industrial societies in which schools were designed to provide students with the rules and conventions to solve particular problems via rule-based reasoning. And that was certainly the kind of education that I got in Canada growing up in Toronto and in Winnipeg when I was a young, when I was a young man. Knowing the rules of the democratic state was the most important goal, and this was often taught by means of a textbook assignment recitation pattern. With the advent of consumer society and the replacement of Western high culture with transnational corporate culture, which relies on well-trained technical workers, the focus has moved away from conventional thinking to technical thinking. So this also, I would identify roughly as taking place within 1985, and I, can, I don't have all the statistics and stuff about gross national product and things like that to, to back me up right, right now, but I can get it to you if you're interested. What this ultimately excludes, of course, is critical reflection, or producing knowledge from real life problems, or what Richard Quantz calls meaningful action, Meaningful action does not always take place in situations where relevant knowledge is available or where people are aware of what the right choices and actions might be. Meaningful knowledge does require some knowledge of technical reasoning, but it requires as well the ability to interpret and the ability to critique, to make moral choices, and to commit to some action even when relevant knowledge is not available. It requires larger patterns of understanding and reasoning, and it requires us to create and recreate its own foundation 
and goals as it goes along. Given the abandoning of political institutions such as schools by the state, the focus has been on technical problem solving as a means and reasoning that involves selecting from available rules those that will help individuals achieve a particular end. This move from conventional thinking to technical thinking to a type of bottom line thinking shifts away from state and local guidelines to bottom line ends and ultimately embraces the new heteronomy of corporate culture. And it makes meaningful knowledge and action, or what Sigmund Bauman calls autonomous thinking, less a part of the school experience than ever before. If we need to make the public sphere capable of creating autonomous individuals and autonomous society by subjecting institutions that boast de facto validity to the rest of de jure validity, what type of critical reasoning is required at this urgent historical juncture? And I I try to ground this kind of thinking in a, a Marxist humanism and uh, the, the notion of Raya Donevskaya of absolute negativity. And this is just to give you just a brief glimpse and take me about five more minutes. Is that okay? But just a few more minutes and I can sort of ground this notion of absolute negativity as a way of looking at critical pedagogy not simply as a classroom sort of methodology, but as an introduction into a way of life, a way of living uh, one's life as a form of dialectical praxis. Now, Peter Hudis from Chicago, um, wonderful young philosopher, has noted that the genius of Hegel, and you have to understand that the Marxist humanism that grounds my work is very much a Hegelian Marxism. And that's important to understand because when you give up Hegel, when you give up uh, transformation, like the, the notion of transformation, like the Frankfurt School theorists, you're kind of locked into the plane of imminence. You're in, locked into this plane of imminence. So Hegel allows for a kind of transformation it's very important, I think, for understanding Marx, and that's why I'm stressing Hegel. Hughes notes that the genius of Hegel was that he was fully aware that negation is dependent upon the object of its critique. In other words, ideas of liberation are impacted in, in one way or another by the oppressive forms that one tries to reject, and that negation per se does not totally free one from the negated object. But unlike the postmodernists that centuries later followed him, Hegel believed that there was a way for negation to transcend the object of its critique and actually create something new. He therefore introduced the notion of the negation of the negation. Now, Peter Hudis makes clear that the negation of the negation, or second negative, negativity, does not simply refer to a continuous series of negations that can potentially go on forever and still never free negation from the object of its critique. And that's, I think, where the Frankfurt School is kind of locked. Marcuse, for instance, locked in this, this kind of negation. He therefore, uh, oh yes, um, okay. Hegel instead argues for a self-referential negation. And I've been trying to take this notion of self-referential negation and try to make it work and integrate it into critical pedagogy as a philosophy of praxis. By negating itself, negation establishes a relation with itself and therefore frees itself from dependence on the external object. This kind of negativity, second negativity, which I argue has to be, become part and parcel of our critical thinking, is absolute insofar as it exists without relation to another outside itself. In other words, negation is no longer dependent on an external object. Now let me give you a practical example. The capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. But capitalist production begets with the inexorability of, a law, of the law of nature, its own negation. It is the negation of negation. 
This does not reestablish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisitions of the capitalist era, on cooperation, the possession in common of the land and of the means of production. Capital takes away individual property and substitutes for it private property. Labor takes away private property and gives the individual property based on common ownership of land and the means of production. <coughs> Practical revolutionary activities, such as historical materialist critique, protests and strikes, is a mediating activity. It is activity that by producing knowledge of the social totality and actively acting to change it, moves toward negation of the negation and simultaneously produces class conscious activity. So it's kind of, one other example would be communism. The abolition of private property. You could say that that's the negation of capitalism. But this negation, Marx tells us, is dependent on the object of its critique insofar as it replaces private property with collective property. That's why Marxist humanists have always been very critical of the ex-Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc police states. They basically simply uh, replaced private property with collective property. Communism, therefore, is not free from the alienated notion that ownership or having is the important or the most important part of being human. It's still dependent on this notion of having as being the most important part of being human. And it simply affirms it on a different level. Of course Marx thinks that it's necessary to negate private property, but this negation, he insists, must itself be negated. Only then can the truly positive, a totally new society, emerge. So, uh, this notion of second negativity or absolute negativity, I think, is, is really quite uh, uh, an important concept. And I'm going to just end with giving you one other example of how perhaps one can employ it um, in, a, in, a context, in a pedagogical context. And I'm going to quote the process philosopher Anne Fairchild Pomeroy, who uses the concept of absolute negation in her discussion of the work of, the, of Marxist humanism. The first negation occurs when we negate our status as objects of history, when we refuse to be commodities in the service of neoliberal capital, when we shout a resounding no to serving as wage labor for capital. That's the first negation. No, I am not wage labor. I am not wage labor. That's the first negation, right? Here the emphasis is on the not. I am not wage labor. That's the first negation. This is similar to the dialectical method of Marx, actually, moving from the concrete to the abstract through a kind of understanding. When we become self-conscious of our act of negating our role as wage labor for capital, in other words, when we become more self-reflexive about it, then we can begin to participate in what we call the second negation. And this is greatly facilitated by the kind of self-reflexivity taught by critical educators. And it's similar to moving from the abstraction that's involved with as understanding back to the concrete through a type of critical thinking that we might call reasoning. Here, understanding our relationship to capital through a dialectical method can help us reflect upon the refusal of our status as capitalist labor. It can help us see the positive content of our original act of negation. Recognize that capital is dependent upon their labor power and thus help them acknowledge their own power through acts of self-determination. Here's the second negation then. I am not capital. So the first is I am not capital. That's the first negation. The second is I am not capital. Right? I am not capital, and then I am. So the emphasis is on the am. The emphasis in this instance is on the am. In the second negation, through the movement of understanding towards reason, we're able to become more critically self-conscious about our power as subjects of history. In Pomeroy's terms, 
individuals then recognize themselves as the one with the power to say no. So the first negation is the, is, is the no. The second is the recognition that we're the one with the power to say no as the very source of negation. And thus we have become, through this recognition, the subject of the movement of history itself. In other words, we can come to understand ourselves as agents of history. And in this case, come to recognize ourselves through the abstraction of understanding as the source of the valorization of capital. So we can begin to see ourselves and those, those like us as the source of profits for the rich. Right? As slaves to capital. And then take charge of our own creative capacities and realize it's possible to build a future outside of capital's value form, outside the social universe of capital and value production itself. But this future can only come into being when we, ref when that when we refuse, when our refusal is joined by others in a collective movement to fight capitalism at it, as its roots. Now, so, this is something I just want to highlight very briefly in, in, in conclusion. Look, you've got a kind of Hegelian Marxist approach to critical pedagogy, which I've been trying to develop over the years, that's built upon this notion of, second, of absolute negativity. Um, and counterposed to that, you have a lot of different kinds of critical theories. They're very interesting and I think also very important. Grounded in work, <coughs> Frankfurt School theorists are grounded in the autonomous Marxism of Antonio Negri or Michael Hart, folks like that. I just want to end by distinguishing the kind of um, humanist, Marxist humanist approach that I take from those other schools of thought. And I think there's just one example here. I'll use the example of Marcuse. Marx's answer was not resistance via a kind of radical aesthetics, but rather a very systematic, demystifying philosophical and social analysis. That is, a dialectical and materialist philosophy. Marcuse's radical aesthetics, and that of other Frankfurt School theorists, don't really provide a dialectical ground for forward motion. And this is something that was made by Charles Wrights in much of his writings. In this sense, much of critical theory is essentially circular, comprised of a kind of polar reciprocity and a kind of frozen paradox paradoxical just, uh, juxtaposition. This, Wrights argues, is really a kind of pseudo-dialectics against the self-reflexive logic of the aesthetic ontological approach of the Frankfurt School, for instance, Marx's dialectical understanding of capital social relations raises the problems and possibilities of intervention against material relations of oppression and alienation, and not just shifting from one pole of a contradiction to the other. And that's why I think we need Hegel. The first thing we need is a dialectification of consciousness, comprehending that only the oppressed have the power to recognize the dialectic of interdependence that binds the subjectivity of the master to the, sub to the subjugated condition of the servant. There's a social power imbalance that prevents the master from recognizing the truth of this condition, but disposes the servant towards it. We need to examine our social location through our own doing and the doing of others. And this reciprocal doing must be objectively framed and structured. We need to embrace, therefore, a dialectical and materialist epistemology of oppression that will enable us to see social structure in ourselves and ourselves in the social structure. And for the working class, critique is not only a debate between abstract theses, an ideological battle against false consciousness, but part of a historical battle against oppression and exploitation, a battle against dominant economic, educational, legal, and cultural systems. It's about organized social struggles that can educate us all about alienation, exploitation, and power. In other words, we must refuse to allow the dialectic to become an ahistorical, ascetic, ontological form. We must understand the struggles that have led to standards of criticism in ethics and logic and in art and science 
and the social sciences so as, so as to develop our criteria of judgment. This is something Ke Kevin Anderson talks about. Who notes a similar problem with theorists such as Hart and Negri, who subscribe to this kind of Foucauldian notion of biopower. that stipulates, since power is everywhere and nowhere, it need not be resisted at its pinnacle, but at any point. So if you look at Hart and Negri, for instance, a global multitude of the powerless, this kind of heterogeneous web of workers, of migrants, and social movements, and non-government organizations, is now in place as some kind of web of resistance to capital that can effectuate transformation, even without a unified philosophical approach. Here, Anderson notes, and I agree, that Hart and Negri remain trapped in this kind of pre-Hegelian split between imminence and transcendence. By rejecting all forms of transcendence in favor of remaining on the plane of imminence and trusting in the self-activity of the multitude. Thus, according to Anderson, Hart and Negri cut themselves off from the dialectical notion that a liberated future can emerge from within the present if the various forces and tendencies that oppose the system can link up in turn with a theory of liberation that sketches out philosophically that emancipatory future for which they yearn. In other words, there exists a deep hostility in their work towards any notion of conceptualizing dialectically an alternative to capitalism. While for Marx, the working class was imminent or internal to capitalism, the working class needs to fight not only for a bigger share of the pie, but to overcome capitalism itself, thereby becoming a force of the future in the present, in a force of transcendence. So with those remarks, I'm just trying to sort of give you a little sketch of um, how I'm trying to employ a Marxist humanist approach in and against um, some of the more, um, well, some of the other critical theories that are vying uh, importantly uh, for our attention. And so I hope that that um, will cause us uh, some pause for reflection later on. Thank you very much.